guys ready? Yes, sir. All right, mission is SAR, medevac of a logging injury. We're going to be either hoisting off the beach uh, or landing on a beach. So that's probably the most complex part. We're about to go on a case where a uh, young man had a head injury from a logging accident. We heard he was bleeding from his ears and nose and needed to be evacuated to Ketchikan Hospital. And if anything changes what we briefed, we'll readdress it in flight, yeah. which will probably happen. All right? Yes, sir. All right, let's go. See you out there. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here every day, the highly trained men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. The alarm went off for a logger with severe head trauma. All right, shocks. Crew for ready for taxi. Ready for taxi. One of our big concerns on this case is the weather, and so we're looking at how to get there. If the weather's nice, we can cut right across some of the mountains to save a lot of time. If the ceilings are too low, we have to go around all the islands, which can almost double the amount of time it takes to get there. OK, four tank checks complete. Four tank off check. Cool for ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. All right, time fuel radar. We'll just do a running takeoff if you get that, sir. Yeah. I think we'll get on the go. Like, uh, visibility allow us to cut the corner if you want. Okay. Yeah, please. We knew it was uh, typical southeast Alaska weather. There was uh, showers with low ceilings en route. We didn't, weren't quite sure if we'd be able to go over the top, so we decided to initially head out via offshore. Figure your nose, figure your nose. 6032, 6032, channel 23, I'll copy over. Coast Guard Sector Juno, Roger, request your ETA. I'll copy over. Copy that, sir. They're requesting our ETA. Hold on one second. Blank, we'll take a look at Whale Bay. If it looks safe, we can cut through there. If not, we'll go around. Cut through there, I'll save us time. OK. In a head injury, we have a sense of urgency. We want to get there as safe as possible, but we want to get there as efficiently as possible. So these passes are decision points on every mission, whether we go into them and cut some time off, or whether we go around and stay over water where we know we have good terrain clearance. You can tell about one hour if we don't run into any weather. Roger. Right now, we don't know much about the patient. Uh, we know that he's had a head injury and he's been in and out of consciousness. Uh, we also know that there's a, a Coast Guard boat uh, from Ketchikan that are on their way and uh, probably going to beat us there uh, just due to the proximity of where they're at. Sir, do you mind if Mike and I get on gutter spell to start setting up? Yeah, no problem. Hey, Roger. Mike's a uh, kind of our version of a flying corpsman. He's there to assist me if we need any kind of medical help at all. So I'll start with the IV when we get there, and are you going to head to toe? Let's, let's, I'll do a primary survey of them. Why don't you find out what time it happened, how it happened, when I'm ready, and you're all done with everything. He'll start the IV. We'll roll them, put him in, package him, get out. All right. I'm really concerned about his head injury. Being in and out of consciousness is not a really good sign. Uh, we've also been told that he's bleeding from the ears, which is definitely a very bad sign. Uh, I can go real south real quick. All right, guys, just updating you. We're going to go to Kowak through the Harris River Pass to try and save some time. Roger. Sector Juno, Sector Juno, this is a rescue 6032. Request to know if you have an update on the patient. Over. Roger, he is fine. currently has him in a seat. Oh, a Wow. Get that. Oh. He has a seat collar. They're trying to put him on a backboard. And something about the EMT. Oh, so we got the 47s on station. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. If the 47s there, at least you know you can hoist to them. Oh, yeah, totally. One of the real big problems that we have up here in Southeast Alaska is our radio communications. There's so many large valleys and, and big mountains in between us and whoever we need to talk to that uh, communicating is a real problem for us. Rescue Hilo 6032, 6032, channel 16. This is Sector Juno, channel 16. We've been trying to reach our brethren on the, on the water uh, with no joy. Be advised, we are 08 Mike till we're on scene. Having to talk to a boat that we're only four or five miles away from, we have to relay it back up to Juno, which is another 60 miles away, so they can relay our information and vice versa. There's a 
Roger. 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 Cabin doors coming open. Flight 47261, Coast Guard Helo 6032, channel 1616, over. 6032, this is the uh, 4726. Good afternoon. Uh, do you have uh, an update on the patient? Over. 32461, Roger. That is correct. They are in a Miller board, backboard, uh, sea collar. They're dressing on the wound, and uh, they are ready for extraction. Roger that. If we had a shore party up on the clearing right now, uh, the beach was a little too congested. All right, roger that. So what we're going to do is we're going to circle around, take a look at this clearing and see if that's acceptable for us to get into. Uh, once we're on scene, we were circled the logging camp a couple times just trying to find a good area for us to land. We can land in there. Uh, that's a tight spot. We can come into this gravel area right here. Yeah, just forward of the loader there. there. In between the log piles. Uh, we can go there, or like or we can go in front of the loader. Yeah, the mud, I where think all that mud is. Yeah, that's that a good spot right there. Yeah, just where the road goes up between the logs? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. If we go up to that other gravel beyond the loader, I think it might blow us a lot that, that trailer around and stuff. Once we were able to get there, we realized, hey, we do have a good LZ. Let's put the helo down. We can get the litter out get all our med gear out, we can assess the patient, package him, get him ready to go on the scene. All right, four uh, landing checks, crew brief. All right, it'll be approached to uh, the LZ between the logs. Ready for approach. Ready for approach. You, you're gonna have some tall trees that you're just gonna need to clear me from. Roger, I'll Roger. call you tail clear. We got this guy walking down straight towards us. I don't know what his intentions are, yeah, but he's gonna have to wave off. I'm in the door, you know, I'm looking at your altitude, your depth perception, you're looking at the trees, any obstructions around, because it's a confined area. And our first approach, as soon as we start coming in, uh, someone's walking right through our, our LZ, and that's one thing you have to call out, because if you've got a person standing there, it's not gonna be pretty. Well, our party, you're uh, walking through where? C61, shore party. Um, Apparently, I can't walk through there. We don't want to lose our skiff. Oh, I guess their skiff is beached and they're worried yeah. about us blowing their skiff. Uh, sure That's good. Point. If you want to hustle, we'll uh, hold off for you if you, if you get down there. I think we should be clear of them, but just uh, keep in mind the rotor system. Roger. We've got that one tall tree right there to your right. Yeah. And we've got his loaders moving through yeah. that. Second attempt, we come around. We're coming in, clearing the trees. One of the workers in the logging camp starts backing a loader out right across our LZ. They're moving a loader. Yeah. All right, we're gonna have to wave off again. I don't know what that guy's doing. He just backed right up out of that hole. I saw that. Yeah, short party, short okay. party. If you could please tell everybody to stand still. If we keep moving everything, we're never gonna get the hell on the ground. young man had a head injury from a logging accident. We heard he was bleeding from his ears and nose and needed to be evacuated to Ketchikan Hospital. I don't know what that guy's doing. He just backed right up out of that hole. I saw that. Our second attempt, we come around. We're coming in, clearing the trees. One of the workers in the logging camp starts backing a loader out right across our LZ. Yeah, short party, short okay. party. If you could please tell everybody to stand still. If we keep moving everything, we're never gonna get the hell on the ground. One more try, guys. Roger. <laughs> Three's a charm. You're over the log, you're Three's over the road, Ned. And tail's clear. Right. Tail wheel's on deck. Left main and right main. All right, guys. Be careful uh, walking him down. Looks like a mess. Yeah, this is pretty funny. Yeah, I think we slid a little bit in the mud. Yeah, we did. When we did land, the first thing I noticed is you took a step out of the helicopter and your boots sort of sank a little bit because it was so muddy. So we were pretty glad to have the small boat crew there to help us transport the patient. We know that the patient's been hit in the head. Uh, we don't know if there's any other secondary injuries. And so you can kind of get tunneled into, oh, he's got a head injury, head injury, and may miss all the broken bones or internal bleedings that may have been secondary to this. 
take a deep breath for me. Here you go. Take another one. Outstanding. Time to get the patient to the helo. I like to use as many people as possible, especially in a situation like that. If you've got six people, you know, if you were to slip and fall and you lose contact with the litter, then you've got five more that can that stabilize it until you can get back up versus if it's two of you and one of you go down, then the litter's going with you. Everybody's ready for takeoff? Yes, sir. Everybody strapped in. We're on ICS and we are ready. Take off. All right, take off checks are complete. Captain doors come to close. Captain doors close. And Sector Juno from the 6032, be advised we are airborne at this time en route to Wolf Point Catching Camp. Patient is stable. We will be there in approximately 10 mics. Request that you have an ambulance there on site waiting for us. Our copy. Roger, good copy. We already have an ambulance waiting for you on scene. Over. After loading the patient in the helicopter, it was a really quick transit, so the main thing that Chris and I discussed after seeing how stable he was was we were just going to keep reassessing his vitals and just keeping him on O2 and monitoring. About five minutes out, guys. Right. Yeah, he looks like he's in a little bit of pain. Yeah. Well, right. He's going to have a headache in the morning. All right, coming down, guys. You got door speed. All right, cabin door's coming up. I'm just going to kind of come in and then slide left, right here. As we're landing, we know that the ambulance is already there, which is a good relief because we know that we can pass him off immediately and get him off to the hospital. It's going to be a is on deck, cool fan. Being a part of the organization and what we do here and provide the service for the, the community and the residents of Alaska, it really is a, it's rewarding. You're able to, to help someone out that's in a time of need. and. At the end of the day, when you hang your helmet up and go home, just put a smile on your face knowing that you were able to contribute to society in some type of way or form. I woke up in camp, and they told me I got hit, and I don't know if I was going to be all right or not. Next thing I knew, I was on the Coast Guard helicopter. I ended up with a little bit of hearing loss and a cracked skull and my brain was bleeding. It was serious, but I'm alive. I just want to say thanks to the Coast Guard for coming and helping me and getting there fast. Flight plan is on file with the yellow sheet. Uh, the weather is good, both here and in Juneau. Today is my last flight here at Air Station Sitka. Maybe my last flight ever, maybe my last flight in the H-60. So it makes it a bit of a special mission, special day. Shock, removed, reported for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. There we go. As the clock ticks down, my last days here at Air Station Sitka, there's a lot of bittersweet feelings to it. The hardest thing to leave is going to be the crew. At the end of the day, it's probably the people that's the best part. I mean, just the, the crew here is sick as awesome. You guys are you guys rock. So, but right close behind that is flying. Flying in Alaska when the weather is gorgeous is unbelievable. The mountains are huge. The water is clear. The you've got whales. You've got other wildlife around. It's just really awe-inspiring. So beautiful weather for the last flight made it pretty cool. There's a certain sense of satisfaction you get after you've had a white knuckle flying in the goo, you get back, you're like, ah, yeah, right on, we'll still do that. So I like that, too. Every air station faces bad weather at some point. What's unique about Alaska is when you couple the distances, the remoteness, the terrain with the heavy weather, that's what makes Alaskan flying really challenging. Dr. Gino, 3 be advised our final approach back to you, home plate. Oh, it's right there. It's right there. In many ways, as a Coast Guard aviator, you're in your spurs up here. And this is where you really put the polish on. Did you write this? I didn't know anything about it, Cap. It's a unique opportunity. It's a unique challenge to be able to, to operate up here and, and conduct missions. Gee, you guys, what's this effort? 
And I can't see a thing. <laughs> Thank God that uh, we just repainted the lines. Yeah. Even though it's embarrassing to have all this fuss made over you, it makes you feel good that they went to that much effort and that much trouble. And it really just kind of puts the capstone on the day. Great weather, great crew, with a great ending. And I can't think of many, many ways that are better to go out on. The motor vessel took a rogue wave, and we have severe injuries to three crew members aboard the vessel. Swimmer's going down. The fly surgeon's concern is, is that these guys could lose their legs if we don't get them to uh, medical care as quick as we can. Keep a hand hold on him. I got him, sir. So I think you guys all have the picture of what's going on with the vessel. It took some heavy rolls, probably in 30 or 40 footers. It's been over 24 hours. You got compound fractures, heavy lacerations, possible head injuries. The motor vessel took a rogue wave, and we have severe injuries to three crew members aboard the vessel. They were inside the cabin, the rogue wave hit, and they were launched across the cabin, impacted the wall on the other side. So we're going to send two H60s on this one. The severity of the injuries also call for a flight surgeon to go with us. The problems you have is you got the three folks, like we talked about, pretty bad shape. So you're gonna take the dock, you're gonna take two swimmers, two helicopters, one's gonna deliver two folks plus two litters, then the other helicopter's gonna pull in, deliver uh, another rescue swimmer and another litter. And we're planning on rendezvousing with them uh, today at the 200 nautical mile point. So 200 nautical miles for the H60 is about an hour and 40 minute flight. Uh, which will allow us to get on scene and have 30 minutes to an hour of hover time per aircraft. The captain's really pushing hard through big seas, trying to close as much distance as he can towards that 200 nautical mile rendezvous point. Obviously, the flight surgeon's concern is, is that these guys could lose their legs if we don't get them to uh, medical care as quick as we can. C-130s will provide cover the whole way for you, just up, up high. Guys, I want you to hang on scene in orbit, too, the entire time. Um, you can pass comms back, anything they need, all that stuff. Questions? Oh, yes, sir. All right, be safe. C-130 does a couple of different things for us. The biggest thing it can do is get on scene first, determine the best winds uh, when we're en route. But the other thing they do for us is they can start talking to the vessel and give them an idea of how we want to conduct the, uh, the evolutions. That's going to help us save gas. It's going to give us more time on scene. 6 0 4 4 should arrive on scene first, and we'll be about 15, 20 minutes behind. They're going to deliver the flight surgeon and the corpsman so that they can uh, assess the situation. So after a couple hours of coordination in the Kodiak hangar, uh, prepping the cabin for the equipment that we're taking out there, the plan is for my aircraft to head out first. Uh, we've got the second H-60 helicopter. Uh, they're just a few minutes behind us. All right, we're about uh, six minutes behind them on the taxi. Coming up about 100 feet. Clear on the right. Coming on the right. Okay. It should be about 191 miles. Well, the Bering Sea and the, and the Gulf of Alaska are notorious for being big, being dangerous. And uh, when a 600-foot vessel reports that they've hit a wave big enough to injure their crew members, who are probably seasoned mariners and have been underway for a large portion of their life, uh, we know the seas have gotten really big out there. One, two, four, four. Just wanted to know if you guys had uh, figured out where the preparations uh, were being made for the voice. Roger, thanks, guys. So the C-130 is out ahead of us, talking to the vessel and doing a lot of the briefing items, talking to the crew members, you know, seeing what the on-scene conditions are, and essentially setting the scene up for a successful hoist. We got them in sight up the net. Yeah, those towers are pretty big. Yeah. So are the antennas on the superstructure then. As the first helicopter on scene, one of the big concerns right now that I have is our on-scene time. Uh, I've briefed my swimmers and I've briefed the flight surgeons that they've got about 20 to 30 minutes total to get this entire mission done before we have to point the aircraft back to Kodiak and start heading home. 
Zach. Yes, sir. Once we put Eli down, how much time are you going to need to get uh, Doc in the basket? I can have him ready to go before I even put him down. You know, the faster we can get these guys going, the better. Roger. We, uh, we count the count. As we're evaluating the ship, we uh, notice a really big area in front of the superstructure. Vince Jansen and myself talked about how we could use that area. It was a, a good open area. Well, what do your guess say, Bill? Um, I would say for the forward area. I could at least yeah, have them go down to it and see what they think about transiting to there with the patient. Right. I see a ladder right here. That does not look like fun with a survivor, but at least I would get you guys down there. Right, right. Ready for a direct deployment of the swimmer to the boat. Right here. The swimmer's going down. Rescue check boat complete. Ready for a direct deployment of the swimmer to the boat. Right here. And uh, check swimmer. About a 600 foot freighter. They've apparently been hit by a large wave. There's three injured crew members. Uh, the status of the crew members is a little bit un unknown, but we know that there's some compound fractures and there's a possible head injury. Swimmer's going down. Board 20. Clear left. Swimmer swinging for you. Dana, easy forward. Easy forward. Both swinging quite a bit. Swimmer's on deck. Swimmers away, swimmers okay. First voice was a little hairy. The boat was moving pretty fast and trying to keep up with the movement of the boat and uh, dropping the swimmer down. Um, then dropped the flight surgeon down after that. And I, I probably scared him a little bit being that high off the boat. Basket's outside cabin door. Let's get right there. Going down. The wind was trying to push me and I had the bag and that was the first time I was thinking, oh, this is, this is a little scary. It was a little bit different. I don't do this every day, so hoisted down 50 feet. I, that was the farthest or the longest I've been hoisted down. Baskets on deck. Traffic, traffic. 100 feet. And helicopter number two is now ready. Once the first aircraft got everything delivered down, we moved in. We put down another two liters and our rescue swimmer in the basket uh, to that area for the bridge. And for that cabin door. We had a good game plan to begin with because we got to watch the other crew do it, and there was already a swimmer on deck, so he could help our swimmer out. All for this. And swimmer is on deck. Disconnect. Conservatively, you guys have about 20 minutes over. We had a very small window of time to get them back up and to be able to get back with fuel. They took me to the first person who was probably the most injured one then went on to the second person. Same thing, went in there, um, multiple injuries. They had him splinted very well. Went and saw the third um, survivor after that, but they had treated him well with what they had. Uh, without question, it was the crew that really helped these folks out more than anything else. Summer 6044. Looking at fuel, and we only got like 400 pounds left. So we need to start hoisting over. That. I found the doc. He was still putting the IVs in. Once I got my eyes on the patient, uh, you know, he was in a much more critical state than I had expected. Compound fracture to his left leg. His right arm was broken. Uh, he had some bleeding out of his uh, ears and nose. So we were just keeping an eye on his uh, blood pressure, SpO2, anything like that. We put the patient in a sea collar and then put him on the backboard. We need to show on the road. Yeah, starting to run out of time. Looks like he's getting us the patient right now. Looks like you ready to roll? Yes, sir. The gentleman with the most severe injuries and the head injury, he's going to come up first into my helicopter, and we're going to get him back to Kodiak as soon as we can. Easy ride. Turn second load. Taking load. Litter is clear of the vessel. He got about halfway up to the cabin, and I realized his face was definitely pretty beat up, and he took a bad fall. Keep a handhold on him. I got him, sir. Bringing litter inside the cabin. I've never had a case where somebody was this badly hurt, so I knew how to get it done as fast as I could. 
And sending all suits back down. Ready. After we got the patient in the helicopter, uh, we had Doc uh, jump in the basket so he get hoisted in the helo. After Doc got in the helo, they kept the basket attached, sent it back down to me. Bring the basket inside, Kevin. We got the one swimmer, one Doc, one survivor. I think that's it for us. If you get the trail on, we'll uh, get out of here. We're at minimum fuel at this point. We've got to head back to Kodiak. And obviously, I'm thinking about the other helicopter and what their fuel state is. They got all their people. Yeah, yep. We're moving right in. My goal was just to keep the fuel situation off of the mind of the of the pilot and the flight mechanic, um, so they can concentrate on the uh, the hoist and evolution and not worry about gas. So as soon as we moved in, we're able to pick up one litter, uh, brought that litter up into the cabin. Three litter inside cabin. Five over. And hook's going down. You got to close, man. The first guy we picked up had a, a pretty bad leg injury. He was definitely in pain, so I wanted to make sure that I kept his leg somewhere that the corpsman could actually work on him if need be. This is good. First thing going. Second load. Litter is on its way up. And hold. Obviously, when you're in a hoist and you're looking at the fuel that closely, that's uh, it's a pretty major concern for you, uh, knowing that there's not any other spots to land for 200 miles. I don't know if I'm going to be able to bring that basket in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, can we do that? How we normally hoist the corpsman is with a basket because they're not harness qualified. I realized there was no room for the basket, so we had to do a mad poo pickup of the swimmer and the corpsman. Take the load. Take the load. Move the survivor, clear the deck, clear the loop back left 30. Control the swing a little bit. Get a few blow counts. How's our survivor doing? Over fracture of his left leg, probably several facial fractures. Now, he may have a chance to save that leg, too, because he does circulation in his feet. So that's good. You know, on approaching the Kodiak, we can already see that the ambulances, they're already on deck waiting for us, and which is a really comforting feeling, knowing that we're going to be able to transfer the survivor as fast as possible to uh, you know a higher level of care. In a case like this, you want to get them out of that helicopter as quickly as possible. The air ambulance is there. They know what they're doing, and they pretty much take over. Stand by, stand by. One, two, three, up. Clear. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. Two, three. Okay. Two, It's really cool to be a part of a mission that has this many moving parts. You know, we've got C-130s, the H-60s, we've got civilian uh, air ambulance services, we've got the fire department that's out here helping us transport the survivors. One, two, three. Okay. Right out. Uh, pretty good. The, the guys on the ship, the crew on the ship did a great job of doing what they could, could to help him. Uh, kudos for those guys. I mean, for not having medical skills, they they improvised and came up with splints and uh, did a pretty good job. Today we've got a call for a medevac out of Haynes. Had it went up to 40 knots. I mean, it's blowing. It could be one of those flights. He's unconscious and having a ventilator breathe for him. Right there, we know that he's in, in serious shape. We need to get this individual in the air as fast as we can. How close are we to all plates? We're about uh, 20 minutes out. Going in the airplane, buddy. Going in the airplane. Well, I'm Vincent Jansen. I'm here with my wife, Ellie, today, and my son, Fraser. And we're uh, heading down to Fraser Lake. You ready for a big adventure? 
<laughs> We're going on a last little adventure in Kodiak today before we leave the island so that Vincent can go to grad school down in Arizona. Are you guys ready for the flight? Hey. I'm excited. Awesome. Yeah. Today we're flying with Chris, my neighbor, uh, here in Kodiak. He's a pilot, flies the Beaver, the float planes, and uh, he's going to take us down to the south side of the island. Living in Kodiak, so little of the island is accessible by car. It's really great to get on a float plane and see the rest of the island, which is just incredibly beautiful. Well, after four years in Kodiak, you know, I've done a few flights over the island and gotten to know some pretty cool spots, some of my favorite passes. So it was really fun getting a chance to point out some of those spots to my wife and pretending that my son is actually going to remember it. We saw loads of mountains and lakes and lots of beautiful rivers, and you realize just how vast it is and what a real wilderness it is out there. The landing was very smooth. Fraser, he was asleep the whole time and just woke up when we uh, when we got there. We have to make our way down the trail. It's uh, about a 20 minute walk. A little bit of scout on the trail there. Kodiak Island is known for the Kodiak brown bear. Today we're hoping to see them down uh, kind of in their natural habitat. Oh my god. Bear on the trail. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so amazing. So far, just meander down the trail. Sharing the trail with a bear. That is absolutely my closest encounter with a bear here in Kodiak. Luckily, those bears down there are doing their own thing. You know, humans, we get out of their way, we're in their territory. We had an absolutely amazing last adventure in Kodiak. I'm sad to leave this beautiful place, I really am. Kodiak's been just such an awesome experience for me and, and for my family. Getting a chance to spend our last few days like this with friends, um, couldn't ask for anything more. Maybe a future pilot, but you never know. So. Fraser, he was a star today. Just real content, real quiet. I can't imagine what's going on in that little head of his. I don't know if he'll remember it, but hopefully he'll have a sense of adventure like we did. <gasps> what a day, he enjoyed every moment. Probably an hour and a half from the time of airborne, but I'll, I'll give you an updated ETA. We do not have the weather today to go over the top, like direct. Today we've got a call for a medevac out of Haynes. All right, we'll get rolling. We've got a gentleman who's having seizures. The initial call is having us take him to Juneau for handoff to Guardian Transport down to Seattle or Anchorage. 56-year-old with seizures, blood pressure is low. He's unconscious and having a ventilator breathe for him. Right there, we know that he's in, in serious shape. We need to get this individual in the air and to Juno as fast as we can. All right, coming up, guys. Roger. Let's do it. It takes about two hours to get up to Haynes. Even as we were taking off from here, the weather was uh, deteriorating. Immediately, we're in snow showers. All you see is a you know blurry white in front of you. Temperature out there now? Minus six now, minus seven now. Had a wind up to 40 knots. I mean, it's blowing. It's going to be one of those flights. Cold, windy, overcast, typical winter Alaskan weather. Yeah, he said he'd been complaining of a headache for the last week, and then last night he just went into seizures. My blood cell count is really high, like way high, so they're fighting an infection somewhere. Was it just the doctor, not the nurse? I don't know. He's on a, a ventilator. It's way above any of us. We do need to bring a doctor with us. Luckily, there's a doctor at Haynes that's been with him since the beginning of this. Head sector for the rescue three. We're on a final approach for Haynes. Wow, this is the best weather of the AOR right here. Guys, pack. Yeah, going to freeze. That's crazy. The land right there. After flying about two, two and a half hours, ironically enough, as soon as we could see Haynes, the weather cleared up and it was the best weather of the day as soon as we got to our landing site. All right, park break. It cleared out, boys. Roger. So we successfully landed, taxied in. The uh, ambulance was uh, awaiting our arrival. I immediately boarded the ambulance. 
the patient was completely prepackaged and ready to roll. With the patient's size, it was pretty tough. He's a, he's a big boy, and luckily we had enough strong guys over there to help us out. At one point, I walked over and talked to the family. You know, just kind of gave him a hug and told him everything was going to be okay. The doctor was ready to go. He had the ventilator and oxygen and an IV all ready. Brought him into uh, our helicopter and got him situated and strapped in. Hey, let's lift his head up. He's asking. This individual is really sick. We started building up with fluid and we had to start suctioning out all of his mucus and some of the blood that was coming up from him just to keep his airway open, just to keep him breathing. We will be on deck shortly. There's a 50-year-old male who's suffering from seizures and is currently unconscious and on a ventilator. Sector 6030 be advised, we will be on deck shortly. How close are we to home plate? We're about uh, 20 minutes out. The original plan was to pick the patient up in Haines and take him directly to Juno. And with a 50-knot tailwind on us, it would only take us about 15, 20 minutes. All stations, all stations. Passing weather service has issued a storm right, warning go, for guys. the northern Wind Canal area. A rescue 38 sector, uh, be advised, plans have changed. Uh, you guys need to go to Sitka for the Guardian flight. But we find out that the weather's so bad in Juno that Guardian Life Flight can't take off from there. And so now we have to take the patient all the way back to Sitka. Sector from 38, stand by, we need to check fuel. Good copy. So now instead of a 15 to 20 minute flight, we're looking at another two hour flight. All right, guys, we've used half our fuel as of right now. We just got to make sure that we can do it with the reserves. We still have a monster tailwind, which is working to our favor. They were asking us to significantly extend our legs and significantly extend how long we had this patient being on a ventilator, bouncing around in turbulence in the back of a helicopter. He's at two liters right now on that. More because he's intubated. OK. Luckily, the doctor will be there. We can keep him sedated as best she can. Uh, and hopefully, we have enough drugs for the whole ride. All right, buddy, hold on. He's starting to come to you, Doc. He's a face. Uh, he's coming out of it. It's spicy. Progressively throughout this flight, he starts to kind of start really fighting and waking up. Hard medicine here. Hopefully, they'll kick in. Yeah. Oh, glad we didn't stop the fuel. OK, we'll do. He's pulling hard. But he's fighting my hand pretty hard. I jumped on his arms and was just trying to restrain him because he kept trying to rip his ventilator out of his mouth. Blood pressure's low, so we need more fluid. We've got other bags if you need it, ma'am. Open it all the way up. OK, Roger. You guys having a problem? Uh, he's just doing better when we left. Towards the end of the flight, his vitals start dropping. His heart rate's going lower. His blood pressure's going lower. And it looked really grim. Sorry, ETA again? Yeah, about 12 minutes. We both kind of had one moment where we kind of exchanged a look and kind of realized that this wasn't going very well. And, and he's on this spiral downward curve to death. Sector 603 AB advised, we need to expedite the training for this uh, patient. I have sick of EMS waiting on us, sir. No, Guardian should be there. Guardian will be right there, wait. You better be. Sector 3 advised, uh, Guardian is uh, on deck waiting for the transfer over. All right, if you could notify him, then we will be on deck shortly. We would appreciate it. You guys ready for landing? Ah, uh, yes, sir. So, uh, straight into the taxiway. All right, sir. The uh, main approach to the taxiway is set down and got as close to uh, the Guardian aircraft as we safely could. All right, parking brakes, take All right, we're out. I walked out with the doctor, and, and uh, Chris Blyle stayed with the patient, and I went over and and got a crew together to come back and help us lift the, the patient and carry him over to the jet. It takes multiple assets to get a medevac done in an area like this. Fortunately, we had the tools at our disposal, and, and everybody was able to uh, calmly figure out what our capabilities are and what they're not. For Southeast Alaska, that's absolutely the norm. My name is Pete Katzik. 
I woke up here in Anchorage and I was told I had seizures. In sector for a final approach for Haines. I thank the Coast Guard for coming to get me in such terrible weather. And if it wasn't for the Coast Guard, my wife would be at home burying me down. All right, up, guys. I got two great kids and a wonderful wife. I need to take care of them. But because of the Coast Guard, I got another chance. Thank you. My name is Captain Ward Salen, and today we have the change of command ceremony here at the air station. Station 10 Hut. Commander Mark Visley, coming from Air Station Kodiak, Alaska. He was the operations officer. Uh, here I'll be the commanding officer for Air Station Sika. Good morning, and welcome to this great event, this important change of command. Commander Visley, you have been well trained, and you will never have a more satisfying assignment in your life. You know, command was always a dream. I think it's a dream of every officer. Of course, you're anxious. You're a bit nervous. It's, it's a lot of responsibility. Captain Ward Sandlin, today you leave behind a command and a district that is better off because you are here. I've been commanding officer of Coast Guard Air Station Sitka for the last two years. And I can say it's been the best two years of my entire career. 189 star cases, 54 lives saved. We found fishermen in fish totes. We had heroic rescues on mountainsides, and I couldn't be more proud of you. I think that the crew is what I'm going to remember the most, uh, because it's the crew that makes the unit. Sir, stand ready relieved. Sir, I stand relieved. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present Commander Mark Visley, Commanding Officer, Coast Guard Air Station, Sitka. I've been in for 20 years now. I think a lot of us work for opportunities like this, and I was just a little bit lucky. Sitka's a wonderful place. Here at Air Station Sitka, it's not really a job, and it's more of a calling. To put the good of the American people ahead of your own, it is difficult. But for the folks who are willing to make those sacrifices, the rewards are immense.